We know a great deal about life of the past, a whole lot more than we should, considering how fragmented, shifted, and cracked the fossil record is. With what we know, we know we're getting a lot of things correct. There are ways to validate and confirm certain aspects of biology of past organisms. However, there are some aspects that are known unknowns, or even unknown unknowns. Stuff we know we don't know versus stuff we don't even know we don't know. What if everything we know about life of the past and how that life looked and acted is part of that unknown category? Let's take a trip through the pages of a book that asks that very question. So in the wild, animals will mate with just about anything if they're sexually frustrated enough. If they are sexually aroused, excited, or unable to find their own kind, due to whatever reason, they will use whoever is closest. As unsettling as that is, it's just kind of a thing that happens. It also just kind of happens pretty darn often. It also happens more frequently during times of environmental stress, such as population reduction or populations being brought closer together from climate problems. Closely related interspecies relations may result in hybrids, but distantly related couplings is just to relieve at least one of the parties involved. Elephants go through a testosterone-fueled madness during their breeding season. We call it must. They will go to town on anything big enough and close enough, like rhinos. So, the next All Yesterday's entry is a very aroused Stegosaurus forcing himself on a Haplocanthosaurus. CM Kozman has also added another layer of plausible speculation in the Stegosaurus's enormous Johnson. I discussed this hypothesis in my dinosaur reproduction video, so if you want to learn more about all that, go watch the video. You know what's really rare in Paleo Art? Showing everyone's favorite, awfully great reptiles just playing around. I'm sure they felt joy as most weren't mindless drones. Here a Camarasaurus is shown taking a mud bath as an elephant might. This lack of playing dinosaurs might have something to do with the old trope that these animals were all dumb monsters. Play is thought of as something only for smart animals, even though plenty of other animals like turtles, crocs, monitor lizards, and of course birds do some playing every now and then. Even though something like Camarasaurus was huge, it definitely could have taken a mud bath. Easily one of the worst things predators do in the movies is roar unprovoked. Predators almost never vocalize when hunting. Why would they? That would risk scaring away the prey they just spent hours tracking down. The same goes for extinct predators. Something like Tyrannosaurus would be silent. On top of that, they too needed to take a nap every now and then. So here we have a silent, sleeping Tyrannosaurus all snuggled up like a 7-ton house cat. Something that is also very rare in paleo art is showing animals doing what they aren't good at. Plenty of modern animals will just do some dumb stuff because they think they can. Elephants love swimming. Crocs will eat leaves and fruits sometimes. Juvenile iguanas randomly leap at the moon and goats will readily scale a tree to get some tasty leaves from the branches. Here, Conway has illustrated a trio of protoceratops climbing a tree to eat its leaves, even though that's not what their anatomy suggests that they are adapted to do. Crypsis, or camouflage, is extremely rare in paleoart. There are so many modern animals that exhibit this adaptation. A tiger's stripes help them blend in with grass in their environment. Crocodile scoots in mottled coloration break their outline along riverbanks. Dinosaurs definitely took advantage of this. Here, a Majungasaurus is replete with mottled bark-like patches on its skin. It lies motionless on the ground, camouflaged as a log. The animal has a super long body and relatively shorter legs than its relatives, so this sort of log-alike crypsis makes some sense. Guess what? Even marine and aquatic animals do this crypsis thing. Leafy sea dragons mimic seaweed, wabigongs mimic mats of sand and seaweed, and stonefish mimic corals and sponges. Who's to say marine reptiles didn't do this too? Sure, a lot of air-breathing marine animals don't exhibit super high levels of camouflage, but over the span of the Mesozoic, I think it's unrealistic to think it never happened. 
Here a plesiosaur is camouflaged by flaps of skin and erratic coloration, like a wobbegong, to blend in with corals, sponges, and sand. The purpose of the spines and sails of many dinosaurs, and even many extinct non-dinosaurs, has been a debate for centuries. Those of the dinosaurs have been variously hypothesized to serve display functions, warming functions, or as a way to store fat. In this entry of all yesterdays, John Conway reconstructs an Aranosaurus with a fatty hump covered in hard, keratinous armor patches. Dinosaurs aren't your usual reptiles. They are more closely related to birds, and birds are theropod dinosaurs in and of themselves. Many of the non-avian dinosaurs share a lot of physiology and ecology with mammals, as well as birds. So what's to say they didn't store more fat than we are used to seeing in paleoart? Most of the time, dinosaurs are portrayed as shrink-wrapped, or with their skin tightly stretched over the muscles and bones, to the point at which you can actually see some of their bones sticking out. Most living mammals, birds, and reptiles don't show protruding bones unless under stress. Some reptiles are the exception where they have skin tightly adhered to their skulls, and some dinosaurs were certainly like this, while others were certainly not. Here a herd of Parasaurolophus are reconstructed as heck and chonkers with large deposits of fat after a good wet season of gorging. Another often ignored aspect of dinosaurian anatomy are the flaps and bulges seen in many groups of modern animals. Tegu lizards have huge jowls, a slew of reptiles and birds have decorative flaps on their throats, and even some mammals have throat sacs for vocalization or visual display. Though hadrosaurs had their bony head crests for visual and audio display, a huge throat sac or flap could have added to the display as this blindingly colored Lambiosaurus boasts. Their Xenosaurs are some of my favorite groups of dinosaurs. They were easily some of the most unusual. They went through many different reorganizations as new forms were found, going from turtle-like beasts, to vicious, slashing predators, to prosauropods, and eventually to what they are known as today, a weird group of herbivorous theropods related to modern birds. They had humped backs, huge, wide hips, extended bellies, four-toed feet, short tails, long necks, tiny beaked and toothed heads, and of course, long arms capped by vicious claws. Their Xenosaurus was the largest of the group and the least well-known, but is here reconstructed as a giant mountain of feathers. The feathers obscure the true anatomy of the animal as in most modern dinosaurs, and it ends up looking more like a giant ground sloth as it stretches its long tongue out for some scrumptious tree stars. The tiny Ornithischian dinosaurs that populated pretty much every ecosystem of the Mesozoic since the latest Triassic period have had the biggest image change of the dinosaur renaissance. They were traditionally reconstructed as scaly mini-versions of their larger ornithopod cousins, but a slew of new evidence in super well-preserved finds shows us that these little guys were just as clad in dino fuzz as theropod dinosaurs of the same size. Critters like Tianyulung are preserved with a whole coat of dino fuzz and long, hard, quill-like filaments while Kulindodromius had a coat of dinofuzz, but a tail covered in corncob-style scales. Here, the All Yesterday's crew reconstructed the four-tusked Heterodontosaurus with a coat of protofeathers and manes of dangerous quills. A critter the size of Heterodontosaurus would need an extra line of defense. The next piece follows on the speculation of the last. Here is a crash of the small Australian ornithopod Lielinosaura, popularized by walking with dinosaurs. These guys were living in Australia when it was rather close to the South Pole. This meant that it got rather cold from time to time, and may have even frosted or snowed over with months of darkness. These Lielinosaura are reconstructed with an extra poofy coat of white feathers to keep them warm on snowy nights. Their abnormally long tails are tipped with a fan of yellow feathers to act as a flagpole for communication. Microraptor was one of the first feathered dinosaur fossils found. It was popularized in the media as a four-winged dinosaur. 
This led to most reconstructions of the animal in flight, with all four wings extended and its feathers outstretched in full view, almost to tell the viewer that the critter did in fact have wings on its arms and legs, and that it was indeed feathered from head to toe. Here, it is shown rather subdued with a bird-like snout and all of its wings and feathers tucked away. This reconstruction might have also been before it was found that one fossil of Microraptor preserved melanosomes, or color cells, showing it was iridescent black from head to toe. Never think we have the last word on even the most well-known dinosaur. For example, the integument of Triceratops was somewhat of a mystery for a long time until a huge patch of skin impressions was found. These fossils show that Triceratops had a scattering of huge scales all over its body. They were rounded, bump-like scales, but there were also huge polygonal scales with a nipple-like protrusion in the center. Some researchers suggested these scales might have been the base of large keratinous spines, which would have given the animal defense all over its back end where it was most vulnerable. Though this might still be true, it's unlikely since keratinous spines tend to sprout from different places on modern animals. Conway went the full mile and gave us this super spiny trike anyway though. The oldest thoughts on dinosaur biology had them as fat, lumbering dimwits that spent all their time in swamps because that was the only thing that could hold up their enormous bulk. Turns out, there was almost definitely dinosaurs that spent some of their lives like this. Hippos are a thing, remember? Opistocelacaudia is a sauropod from late Cretaceous Mongolia with an extremely wide and round torso and short, stubby legs. It's probably the best bet for semi-aquatic sauropod. Unfortunately, its remains are missing the head and neck, which would help pinpoint just how semi-aquatic it actually was. But Conway has placed it in such an environment. Obviously, the world of the dinosaurs and other prehistoric animals is more than meets the eye or pick. There's always room for plausible speculation. So what did you think about all yesterdays? Let me know in the comment section below and thanks for watching. Make sure you leave a like and comment on this video, share it around and subscribe. While you're at it, ring the notification bell too if you want to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. Want to help Edge out? Subscribe to the Patreon at any tier you like for a whole smorgasbord of delicious offerings. Many thanks to Thea Svensson, Steve Bradshaw, Staniforth Hopkins, Natty Cat, Dinosaur, Arda Bayer, Abby Smith, Henry Brennan, Dana Manchester, Chris Frampton, and Antron. You've all helped to make this channel possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you.